All right, good morning. It's uh, Thursday. And, uh, it's going to be a little cold here. I don't know what's going on in your world, but it's a little cold here. Put my little uh, deal on and uh, hoping it warms up for us. So that's not that cold to most people. It just is to me because uh, I think I was built for the islands. That's what I keep telling myself. So that's where we are. Uh, going to be a good weekend, right, though? The weather's going to be good. And uh, I'm looking forward to just all the activities we have. We're staying, I think, in town. As far as I know, we may do some last minute thing somewhere, but uh, right now the plan is just to hang out here, uh, go see some um, field day events in Aniana tomorrow, hang out with a birthday grandson, and hopefully see him anyway, maybe just a little bit, and then uh, just enjoy life. So um, it's going to be great. Hey, listen, we're in the book of Mark, and um, this is one of those complex passages. Um, it probably shouldn't be. Uh, it's just that it's uh, cumbersome to kind of work through. Uh, let me get to it um, so we can kind of talk about it. Uh, 42, verse 42. Um, so we're, remember that we're looking at lessons that Jesus has been really hammering home at his, uh, at his disciples. He's kind of in that intense, um, high-end, training phase of their life. So he's he's undistracted by the people that are around him at this point. He'll still do some, some miracles and we'll still see some of these things, but for the most part, it's conversations that he's having along the way. And uh, I love that. I love everything about the intimacy of of this conversations that take place. And so if you're not careful and you're not looking at all of the passages, you miss a little bit of the context, which will create some issues. So my role, I see it, is just trying to help us kind of fit it in and understand why he makes the statements that he makes. And so this is where we're going. Uh, we looked first off at, uh, at one of the lessons is that there's power and faith in prayer. Great power in those things. If you're going to be a disciple, and this is just imagine him talking to you as he did his apostles, uh, because we are disciples, right? We are. That is who we are. And so he says, listen, you know, you're going to do this thing. You're going to do this. You're going to have to have great faith in prayer. Uh, just don't have, doesn't have a lot of faith, just, just faith in prayer. Uh, and you're going to see some some powerful things that take place. The second thing he said is that the Christ life is marked with humility, and uh, and that was that was what he was driving home when he brought the child and set before him. And he's still in that context, um, and so it, it's but it's another lesson. They're kind of coming at us fast in this. Remember, they've come down to Capernaum. They're probably entered into Peter's house. We don't know, but they're in a house. The child is brought in. Um, Jesus brings him, sits him down, stands him up then, uh, and says, hey, let's talk about childlike attitudes. And so that was it. And basically the whole point was that we should, um, we, we should, we should be in, have a humble life toward those people, uh, toward everyone. Now we jump into verse 42 and uh, let me just read it, <clears throat> and then we'll, we'll look at things. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, that's how come we know that he's still having this conversation. What he had said before uh, was John had interrupted the conversation and said, hey, man, we saw some guys out there uh, you know, exercising demons out of people, and we shut them down. So there's this... Right, it's an ongoing conversation, just like your conversations. Right, you you're trying to talk, and then somebody brings in a sidebar, and then all of a sudden we're off on that, and then you, you're trying to steer the conversation back to where you're wanting it to go. And but it's it's free and it's fluid, and so that's what's going on here. <clears throat> so we get to 42, and he says, "If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me." Now, so he's no longer talking about just the child, which he wasn't really in the beginning. He was just simply saying. You have to come to the faith as a little child, and, and he's speaking of, of, of all of those things. So he says, listen, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, that, that's what he's talking If anyone causes a believer to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Now, that's a dramatic flavor of, uh, of Jesus and his language, and obviously it's metaphoric, and, and so... Uh, what we're looking at his point. Let's read the whole thing. And we'll come back and kind of break it down. If if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed 
than to, than two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm that worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, if you're looking at this in another version, you may have seen that phrase three times. Uh, you, you won't find it in, in several manuscripts. It's not in mine. Uh, verse 43 and 44 or 42 and 44 are left out in that sense. Uh, because it was added to later manuscripts, probably for emphasis. It doesn't detract from anything. It's just that uh, the oldest manuscripts record him saying it one time. Uh, I don't want to get off into that. It just just for clarity's sake, when you're going, hey, wait a minute, I, I, you left out some stuff. I, that's what's going on. Then he says this, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Now, let's break this down because he's talking to his disciples. And he's, it's again, it's another one of those lessons. And here's, this is the skinny on it. <clears throat> don't be a stumbling block. Don't, don't cause your uh, brother and sister to, to sin. Now, you remember the conversation that got all of this going? The walk along the way before they entered the house, right? And Jesus looks at them as they're going in the house. They say, what were you guys talking about back there? And they didn't want to say anything because they were talking about who the greatest was. This is him continuing the humility aspect, but then saying, listen, stop it. This is I need you to get serious about this call that I'm giving to you. So he speaks in very uh, flamboyant statements um, that, that are, uh, I mean, exaggeratedly, starkly black and white. And so, so let's just look at what he says early on. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better than if a large millstone were hung around their neck. Now, you know, a millstone is that big stone that would, that the, as the animal would, would rotate around the, the threshing floor, that, that thing would grind it as he, as he walked around. He said, better to take that thing, which weighed who knows how many tons, have it tossed around your neck and tossed in the sea than to, than to harm my people. So don't miss this. Fellow believers, this is who he's talking about. Don't do harm. He's talking to you and me as disciples. Don't do harm to my believers. Don't do it. So what does he mean there by that? Well, I mean, in, in verse uh, 37 earlier, remember what he said there? Um, Whoever comes welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. He's saying, hey, listen, we're all related here. You come after one of my believers, you're coming after me, and ultimately you're coming after God himself. So he said, and there's something powerful about that. We need to see Christ in all, whatever church you're going to, whatever community you're in, whatever household you're a part of, where there are believers in Christ, you and he's, he hammers this constantly. You should treat them just like they were God, just like they were Christ. This is what he's saying. This is what he's arguing for. So if you listen to that, remember in Matthew 25, uh, when he's shepherd, separating the sheep from the goats <clears throat> and he says, you were hungry. Uh, and I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you uh, cared for me. And I was in prison and you visited me. And they say, when did we do that? He said, whenever you did it to one of the least of these. Least of these harkens back to these little ones, right? Uh, to, to the believers. He said, whenever you do it to one of these, you've done it unto me. And so this is the context. So stumble means, uh, it's, the, it's the word scandalous. Scandalizomai, uh, which means uh, to stumble, to, to create a scandal, to create an obstacle, a, a, a block. I think we do that <clears throat> several ways, right? How can I cause you to stumble? <clears throat> well, I can tempt you to sin, can I? Hey, come here, let me tell you what's going on in old Joe's life over here, right? That's, that's that. I, I can tempt you to come listen as I engage in the sin of gossip and begin to tear someone down, right? Uh, so, so there is that. And he's saying, listen, it's better that you get a millstone around your neck and tossed in the sea than to go gossip 
and, and create a stumbling block, tempt someone to sin. This is serious, right? I mean, I'm having to rethink a lot of things in light of what he's saying here. Sometimes it's by provoking, right? Do not provoke one another, uh, like to anger. So <clears throat> there are times I can, in my sarcasm or in my, um, in my naivety or my arrogance, make statements that will provoke and elicit uh, an opportunity for someone to sin. He's saying, so but basically saying, hey, hey, don't do that, right? And then, and then sometimes it's just my example, right? That's why we're, we're careful about, about what we do, right? I mean, uh, those of you who, who maybe drink, it, you know, it's, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you start flaunting that, it creates a stumbling block. That's what that's what Paul talks about in, in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Don't be a stumbling block. That doesn't mean that don't do something that somebody goes, well, I don't like that. But it's, that so it doesn't matter what people like. It's that if I'm dragging someone into a sin simply by my example, um, and, and they they don't have the faith to do that, then I've created, it, it's sin for them. This is this is what, uh, to him who thinks it's wrong, it is wrong, and it's sin to them. And so uh, those I think those are the ways that you and me can create problems. And, and this is what he's hammering. <clears throat> he's saying, hey, listen, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't cause anybody to stumble. So our life, this is radical. This is, this is, our life should be marked by not tempting you to sin, not provoking you to sin, and not certainly by living an example that will think, cause you to think that it is okay to sin. And so these are the issues that he speaks of here. And then he moves on. He says, if your hand, now these are three kind of staccato type, you know, they just come at you in three. If, if, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. What's he saying here? He's saying, hey, listen, you need to be careful, not just about their sin and their life. You need to be careful about your own too. If you're going to be one of my disciples, don't you, don't you mistreat my fellow believers, but don't you also violate your own life by, by sinning as well. So what's he saying? He talks about the hands, the feet, and the eyes. Well, that's pretty simple because the scriptures are, are prevalent with those kind of languages. The hand would be anything that we do. Don't let your hands do something. Don't, in your activity, do something that's sinful. Better to cut those things off, be done with it. Now, obviously, he's not physically talking about that, although there were some who jumped into that and believed that's what was going on at, later on in some cultic fashion you would crazy stuff. But anyway, he's not talking about literally cutting off. What he's saying is be as drastic as necessary. So, so do what, whatever it takes, but don't you allow your activity and your work to be sinful. Don't do that. And then he, then he speaks about the feet. And don't go any place that's going to lead you into sin, right? That's why we pray, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Don't, don't let my feet wander where they shouldn't go. Uh, so I have to be careful. Uh, they, the, the writer to the Proverbs, Solomon, paints a clear picture of what it looks like when one allows their feet to walk by the house of the adulteress uh, and wander along that way. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is is uh, full of, of metaphors of Vanity Fair, where you get sidetracked and you allowed your feet to take you places where you shouldn't go. And so we say, hey, listen, be careful about where you walk, where you go. Don't don't go to places where you know you're going to end up doing some sinful things. And then your eyes, right? That's that's the gate to the heart. And, and the scriptures speak a lot of that. I will not set my eyes on anything, um, you know, that, that would cause me to sin, the, the, the psalmist says. And so uh, we have to be careful what we see. And, and that, of all the issues, today, that's the gate that Satan uses to, and loves to use. Uh, that those eyes, right? You're scrolling through, it, uh, you know, Snapchat, or you're you're scrolling through TikTok, or you're looking at at Facebook. Man, it it like comes at you, and you're seeing things that, that you don't know. And and the same with like video games and letting your children see some things they shouldn't see. And I'm not trying to rant like an old grandfather. I'm just simply saying we we have to be careful of these things. This is what he's speaking of. Um, and so he goes through that, and then he gets to then he gets to uh, verse forty nine. And he says, everyone will be salted with fire. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, this I'm telling you, man, this is some difficult. If you, if you can't 
it's just difficult to decipher sometimes, but everyone will be salted through fire. To me, I, I go back into the Levitical law. When you were laying, uh, when the priest laid a sacrifice on the altar, he salted it uh, so that it might be pleasing to God. There's something about this preservation, the salt in God that, that is that is mixed in here. And so when I hear that, and then I think about present your bodies a living sacrifice, uh, I believe that he's talking about that term of, of, of sacrificial living, of offering your, your life to God um, and, and, uh, and, and present it, a living sacrifice. So there's this, hey, listen, you belong to God. Offer your life daily to a sacrifice. Um, I think that's, and in some ways, it's like reckon yourselves dead to sin. Right. And in others, it's present your bodies a living sacrifice. I think what he's saying, hey, the whole body, the whole body, everyone's going to be salted with fire. Everyone is going to be a sacrifice in that sense that follow me. And so therefore do that, do that willingly sacrifice, put away everything. It's not about you. This is going back to that whole conversation. Who's the greatest. And then he, then he says this verse 50 and we'll, we'll get out of here. Um, salt is good. But if salt loses its salt, I think, so he mentions salt, and then he goes, hey, while I'm on that subject, right, uh, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If salt, you normally salt to preserve, to enhance. Well, if if, so, what, if the salt is no good, then then what's left to enhance? He said, so don't, what he's saying is, hey, don't don't let that go out. Don't let that purity, don't let that... Uh, that that aspect of life, you stay pure and you stay salty. You stay enhanced and pure. This is basically what he's saying. He says, "Have salt among yourselves, right? Have purity among yourselves." What does he say? And be at peace with each other. Again, this goes back to that conversation when they're you're arguing, you know, about oh, I'm the greatest. Oh, you're the greatest, right? And he's saying, "Hey, listen." Be at peace with one another. It's not, stop it. Stop, stop the comparison game. Stop the climbing and clawing to get ahead of each other. You want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to be the least of these. And then he says, so this is where he comes here. You want to be great in the kingdom, don't cause other people to sin. You want to be great in the kingdom, make sure you don't sin and be as drastic as necessary. You, 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 you want to. You want to be greatest in the kingdom? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You want to be great in the kingdom? Be at peace with one another. That's what greatness looks like in the kingdom. And that's the message that uh, that Jesus is uh, sharing with us today. Man, what, what great truth. This is going to cause me to have to rethink some things in my own life, just like it does yours every day. Doesn't it seem like we do that? That's why I love these daily doses. All right. Lord bless you guys. I'm going to run, grab some donuts, and go see my guys and have a safety meeting. Um, and then I'm, then my weekend starts. So I uh, hope you have a great day and a great weekend. I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing.